There we go. So, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today for um, April's Edinburgh Reproducibility. Um, we're joined today by Michelle Dodd, um, and she is um, an autism researcher, and she's going to be talking to us about replications in autism research. And I think at the end, she's also got an opportunity for people to get involved. So take it away, Michelle. Hi, I think that should probably be opportunity. <laughs> Um, but thank you and um, thank you for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about the things that I'm interested in um, as an autistic person and probably most other people agree. Um, so I'm going to share my pretty looking slides so that you don't have to look at my face. Um, and um, basically sort of introduce you to why I'm here and what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I guess um, nowadays people kind of understand generally why we replicate studies in sciences, um, but um, there's kind of, I think, a bit more reason why this particular study is so important to replicate um, and why we're doing it. Um, but um, we'll start with the kind of why this is happening and then I'll get into a bit more of how we're actually doing it, the nuts and bolts of it all. Um, but I will just say as a quick disclaimer, if you are interested in participating in this, don't don't listen too carefully <laughs> um, because it is a replication. And um, if you know a lot about the original study, um, it might not be too much fun replicating, uh, participating in the replication. So hopefully my slides will change. Yes, there we go. Um, just um, to start with a few key terms. Um, I know many people, I've seen some familiar uh, names in the participant list. Um, so I know a lot of people know about autism nowadays, but I just wanted to clarify that I will be talking about autism as a type of neurology that is just different to neurologies that aren't autistic. Um, there will be identity first language, I think is the right way around to say it. I'm an autistic person. I don't have autism. Um, and um, oh, and I just wanted to point out that it's Autism Acceptance Month, which is really well timed. I don't think we realised this when we were planning it. So, yeah, yes. Um, uh, but um, whilst I'm very much going to be talking about autism in a kind of non-medicalised way, it is still characterised by certain things. And one of those things is social and communication differences and also restricted and repetitive behaviours and interests, which is why I'm doing a lot of this. So sorry if it's annoying, but that's me. Um, so neurodiversity, another kind of buzzword that's flying around all over the place, especially in psychology at the moment. Um, so I thought I'd just give another quick kind of rundown as to what I mean if I mention neurodiversity um, and the neurodiversity paradigm. Um, and this is slightly borrowed from Sue Fletcher Watson, my PI stroke boss stroke favourite person in the world. Um, so if you want to find out more about this, she does some amazing talks on it. She's a brilliant woman. Um, and the references will be at the end of my slides. So you can have a look at like her discussing this properly. Um, but when we speak about neurodiversity, we're basically talking about naturally occurring differences among people and how they work, how they sort of go about the world. Um, neither any particular neurodivergence isn't better than any other neurodivergence. So non-autistic people aren't 
better than autistic people just because of their brain. Um, uh, what's the next one? Um, it can operate in a similar way to um, sort of other minority groups. So autistic people are at risk of sort of being stigmatised against um, and other challenges that other minority groups have dealt with historically and currently. Um, let's not kid ourselves that everything's great nowadays. But the main thing that I want everybody to take away from this is that neurodiversity, diversity in general, is strength. Um, uh, no matter what idiots on Twitter might say. Um, and just a little note, um, a single person can't be neurodiverse, so a neurodivergent person or a neurotypical person is, or ND or NT, are things that I might mention. And I do apologise, I've just heard my housemate's alarm going off in the background, so if there's background noise, I do apologise. And here's a nice little cloud word cloud thing I made just to sort of cover some of the things that are included in the neurodiversity bubble. So whilst I'm talking about autism today, um, we can't forget that that's not the only kind of neurodiversity going on. So sorry about that little lecture. Um, on to the sort of why are we doing this study? Why are we replicating this study? Um, so as I briefly mentioned, the medical model of autism is how these things have been framed historically and still today, um, it's quite pervasive. Um, uh, and this basically states that non-autistic people and non-autistic people socialise fine because they have no communication deficits. Um, when autistic and non-autistic people try to communicate, there's a problem because the autistic people bring in their communication deficit and that causes a breakdown in the communication between the two. So following this model, ooh, what's going on there? following this model, two autistic people shouldn't be able to communicate at all, really, because we're both bringing deficits to the communication and like it would be mayhem, chaos in the communication world. But as many autistic people will tell you, that's just not the case. We tend to kind of get on better with our own kind. Many people have sort of said anecdotally that we can spot the other autistic people in a room full of non-autistic people. There's, there's something going on there. So in 20. 2018, um, some people got together and decided to test what has become known as the double empathy model problem theory. Um, it's got a number of names, but it's based upon the, the theory of empathy in communication. Um, and so the original study happened and they found that autistic people do actually get on with each other just as well as non-autistic people get on with each other. Um, in chains of, oh, I'll talk about the chains in a bit. Um, let's just stick to the slides, not get carried away. Um, this obviously suggests that there's no communication deficit coming from the autistic people or the non-autistic people. It's just, there is something going on when we mix the neurotypes. Um, hence the double empathy theory that uh, communication breakdowns happen because there's differences on both sides, either side. So the original study happened, as I say, in 2018. Um, it was based at the University of Edinburgh and it was conducted by Catherine Crompton and uh, Professor Sue Fletcher Watson, it's probably Dr. Sue Fletcher Watson then, I'm not too sure when that happened. Um, and uh, other people were involved, Danielle Roper from Nottingham and various other people got together and organised this study. It was produced with the help of autistic people, um, 
back in the day uh, when these things weren't as common. <clears throat> Some um, like well-known names in the autistic community helped and gave very good input to actually getting the study off the ground. It wasn't perfect in terms of co-production, but it's something that we're all still working on. Um, and um, even the name came from a conversation with autistic people. So um, the team tried very hard to include authentic autistic voices. And the original study basically looked at information transfer between groups of autistic people, groups of non-autistic people, and mixed groups, so alternating neurotypes. Um, and they used diffusion chains, um, as we call them, to pass the different types of information between participants. And I've put that it was measured, we measured the how much information survived at the end of the, the sort of chain. Um, but that was kind of one of many, many, many um, variables that happened. Um, I think they are still kind of analysing the original data because there was just so much of it. Everyone was so brilliant. Um, and yeah, we're, we're finding out loads of stuff. Um, so diffusion chains, um, just so everybody knows what they are, what I'm talking about when I talk about diffusion chains, there um, it's basically a, a version of the game that we used to play that has a very politically incorrect name nowadays, but is known as um, telephone or operator in America, where you sort of give the information to the first person and then they tell the next person and so on and so on. Um, if you can't figure out what I'm talking about, please do read the literature because it's quite interesting. It comes from, um, it's used a lot in evolutionary biology and psychology um, to kind of, yeah, track sort of cultural changes and differences and stuff. But the way we're using it is obviously um, to see how successfully the information kind of passes through the people. Um, so, yeah, they found out exactly that. Um, autistic people and autistic people get on fine, non-autistics get on fine with each other and when you mix the groups you do get problems, there's communication breakdowns, the rapport is lower um, in general and that's when problems happen. This was huge news to autistic people um, and non-autistic people that care about autistic people um, we're basically saying that we don't have communication deficits, which is all a part of the whole, we're not actually broken people, we're not, there's nothing wrong with us, we're just like you, but we just do things slightly differently. Um, and neither of those ways is better or worse than either of the others. So we need to um, replicate these findings, obviously, to kind of give the double empathy thing a bit more oomph. Um, so they arranged the replication study, which is what I'm doing currently. Um, this time round, it's conducted by an autistic research assistant, me, um, at the University of Edinburgh. And we've got a site in University of Nottingham and also the University of Texas in Dallas, I think is the right way to say it. But Dallas in America. And um, many of us are neurodiverse. I can't kind of out other people. I'm happy to out myself, obviously, but um, the crew on the ground this time around is a lot more neurodiverse. <clears throat> and we're finding interesting patterns just from having more autistic people on board kind of thing, but that will come out in the papers. Um, we're still using the original name because it was a, a well-known study. A lot of people will obviously know it by the kind of names that from the papers, but um, the articles that came from the study. But um, it was it was coined by autistic people, so I think it was kind of quite nice that we kept it all the same. 
and it ensures um, support of the APOs, autistic people, persons, organisations. Um, but we are still looking primarily at information transfer um, using diffusion chains. However, this time round, all of this is a part of an ocean, <laughs> almost said ocean science. Um, nothing to do with oceans or water at all. Um, it's part of an open science initiative. And all our protocols, which were very, very pedantically written by Catherine Crompton, um, are should be by this point all available on the open science framework. Uh, we've got a registered report coming out with a high impact journal. I wasn't entirely sure if I was allowed to release the name of the journal yet, but it's a very big one. It's it goes out to people who are interested in other stuff other than autism as well. So um, that's great news because whilst I'm kind of preaching to the converted, to people that understand the neurodiversity paradigm, it's nice to know that people who still kind of believe what they read in the DSM are, are going to be sort of hearing about what we're actually doing. Um, as it's a replication, we increase the sample size quite drastically. Um, we've got the benefit of having three sites now to collect data in. Um, that is just lifted essentially from the uh, open science uh, page advert kind of thing, um, which probably should be in quotation marks, but um, I'm sure they'll let me off. Um, and we're also going to be looking at whether um, participants are basically this time around, participants are telling us whether they think the person or the people that they're speaking to are autistic or not. Um, and that not only will that kind of give a bit more context when we look at rapport and stuff in relation to the information transfer, but it might also give us some evidence towards the anecdotal theory that autistic people can spot each other in a room because I know it's true and we need decent evidence to prove it. So this is a fun stats and statistics page. Um, the original study had 72 participants and that worked out as eight participants per chain. So each day that they did data collection, eight people would come along. Sometimes four of them would be autistic and four would be non-autistic. And other times eight would be, they'd all be autistic or they'd all be non-autistic. And if you divide 72 by eight, you find out that that made nine research days. Um, and on each research day, participants did four tasks. So um, one was a fictional task, we call it. One was factual task. Um, and there's a kind of surprise tasks, which people who have done the study will know. Um, and if you've watched sort of a lot of the media about it, you'll know. But I kind of like to keep those two as a bit of a surprise for people. Um, and in the replication, we have 324 participants across the three sites. So that's 108 in each site. We are doing six participants per chain per day um, because they found in the original study, by the time the information was passed through kind of four or five people, by the time it got to the sixth person, seventh, eighth person, there really wasn't anything left to analyze. So um, we checked it all out with our fabulous statistician, that word that I can't say, person who does statistics. Um, and yeah, we, they basically figure, I say we, I wasn't even involved at this point, but it sounds good. Um, Catherine, Sue and everybody um, basically figured out, yeah, it's fine to have six participants in the chain. And that way you're not kind of wasting people's time. You're not getting people in knowing that there's not going to be much information that they can give us. 
um, which is nicer for everybody. Um, we will be doing 54 chains. <laughs> it's a bit scary when I read that number, but um, 18 per site. So in the University of Edinburgh, I will be doing 18 research days. I've done six so far. Um, so I've got another 12 to do by September, October. And we are doing five tasks per research day. So the four main tasks that the original had but this time we were thinking because we've got these people in um, and they're taking time out of their day to help us out, we kind of need to make the most of it. So um, we are trying in this replication to <clears throat> have either a paired interaction or a group interaction at the end of the day, um, just to kind of because the rest of the tasks are very sort of formalised, um, we're telling people exactly what to do and stuff. We just wanted to kind of get some data on just how people communicate. It's all about communication and information transfer and stuff. So we're like, how does this happen in a much less formal way? Obviously, it's still a bit formal because you're in a weird place and it's not a laboratory as such, but it, it's uh, obviously a place where people work and do studies and stuff. But we kind of try and make it as as homely. We've had loads of location issues, to be quite honest with you. The lift doesn't work in the building that we're in at the moment. So it's all a big whole nightmare. But um, you don't need to know about that stuff. Um, these are the references if you want to read up more about anything I've kind of ranted about today. Um, obviously, I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Um, but as I say, these people are professionals and very, very good at what they do. So um, Sue Fletch Watson's video, the third one especially, um, check that out. It's brilliant. Um, and there's our website at the end if you would like to read any of this alerted information in your own time um, that's where you can do it and as mentioned um, we are still recruiting participants um, you don't have to be autistic you don't have to be a non-autistic um, so long as you have a vague idea which one of the two you might be um, self diag self-identified people like you're fine to come along um, <laughs> Everyone has to do like a little eligibility form first, just so we can check that we're not putting anyone in any danger by bringing them in. Um, and as I mentioned, the lift isn't working, so I make sure everyone is aware of this before inviting them along. But yeah, if you can come along, it is a fun day. Um, we give you snacks and drinks and stuff and £30 um, eventually. <laughs> um, and any sort of reasonable travel expenses. Um, we're trying to give back as much as we can. Obviously, we appreciate it's a very weird thing for people to do, especially a lot of autistic people who we can be quite stuck in our ways sometimes. Um, but yeah, we've got the funnest box of stim toys you can imagine. So um, if you're interested, have a look at the form, the poster, any of the videos we've got out there or give me a shout in person and I, I think that's reasonably well timed um because that's all I have to say thanks Michelle that that was a brilliant talk that's really interesting thank you for sharing that with us um I'm just going to stop the recording now so that we can go um to the discussion